Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dr. Ruby Gill, and I'm honored to welcome you all on the behalf of lovely professional university. So, attendees, I know you might be wondering the reason of gathering virtually. So, let me reveal the reason and something about the today's webinar. We are going to have an incredible session with our experts today as they are going to tell us all about cyber crimes and legal remedies. So I'm sure you are as excited as I am for today's webinar. So before that, let me allow, uh, let me, uh, so allow me to introduce our experts of the webinar. Dr. Meenu Chopra, Associate Professor, Deputy Dean, School of Law, lovely professional university. An intellectual personality with specialization in taxation laws and holding an experience of 18 years in academics and industry as well. She is continuously keeps on harnessing her skills while pursuing various courses on expandable areas such as soft skills, educational leadership, outcome-based pedagogy, developing IPR and other associated fields. Moreover, she is quite extensive in research and mentored various students of the field. Her expertise lies in business laws, constitutional laws, and matters of social interest. So, ma'am, it's a privilege to have you on board with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. With equal pleasure, I welcome Mr. Ramandeep Singh, Assistant Professor, Coordinator, Moot Court, School of Law, Lovely Professional University. A young and a dynamic professional who is proficient in handling matters in divergent areas leading to expertise in academic and practical matters. He is specialized in cyber laws, criminal and civil procedures. Also, he has an experience of working in court as well. So, sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Further, I would like to welcome I would like to welcome Mr. Neera Sharma, our admission expert and senior officer, lovely professional university. An enthusiastic professional with an experience of more than 14 years in sales and marketing and product promotion. Uh, so, attendees, today he'll brief you about the admission process. So, sir, thank you so much for giving us your valuable time. Thank you so much for joining us. So, with this, I welcome you all to the webinar and looking forward for great interactive sessions. Over to you, sir. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ruby, ma'am. So we are going to talk about cyber, cyber crimes in this session. Okay. What cyber crimes are, how they are distinct from traditional offenses, and what are the legal remedies concerning cyber crimes. Before starting the session, as to what cybercrime is, there are few questions which we must ponder over, which we must think about. For instance, first question is, if a person accesses your Instagram account, your Instagram handle, okay, has he committed trespass? Because we know if you have some property with you, immul property, and somebody enters in your house, without your consent, that is trespass. So here, Instagram account is your virtual property. So if somebody accesses it, will he be liable for trespass? Similarly, if somebody steals money from you, he has committed theft. But if a person accesses your laptop without your consent and copies the material into his pen drive or external hard disk, Will he be liable for theft? Because, see, are you understanding the analogy I'm trying to draw here? Should he be made liable for theft and trespass in these cases as well? The answer is no. He cannot be made liable for trespass and theft when he accesses your Instagram account or when he copies the material from your laptop without consent. Why? The reasons are number one, IPC was passed way back in 1860. And whenever we interpret any law, give meaning of any law, we have to see the intention of the parliament. Since it was passed way back in 1860, 
parliament never contemplated technology at that time that there shall be internet that there shall be computers okay they never contemplated anything of this sort so when ipc was drafted they never had technology they never had cyber crime in their mind so we can say ipc cannot be applied upon these cases similarly the word property is defined in ipc section 22 of indian penal code it defines mul property if somebody picks my phone without my consent and takes it away it is theft but same will not be true if somebody accesses your laptop without your consent and copies some material onto his pen drive he will not be liable for theft why because the word movable property in ipc means corporeal property on and corporeal means tangible things things which can be touched so the virtual property all together is not covered in ipc indian penal code does not talk about virtual things it does not talk about cyberspace this is the reason ipc will not apply upon this hence we can say that there are two classes of offenses from this deduction from this analysis we can deduce something one class is traditional offenses other class is cyber offense the traditional offenses are covered in ipc theft murder robbery extortion all those offenses are covered in ipc but there are some new offenses which were not known to the world they were not existing until internet came into play until technology came into play these are cyber offenses cyber crime they were not there before all right this ipc could not be applied upon these cyber offenses so we needed new laws so indian parliament has passed laws to tackle cyber offenses one of such example is in information technology act the it act it tackles cyber offenses to a great extent some of these examples of cyber crimes given in it act only are number 1 violation of bodily privacy so violation of bodily privacy means suppose a person has gone to a showroom a store clothing store and he wants to try an outfit so he will go to the try room when you go to the try room you expect privacy that nobody will see you okay because your body is exposed there so you are expecting bodily privacy however if somebody installs a camera over there and clicks your photo that is an offense okay that is a cyber offense it is called violation of bodily privacy whenever a photo or video of a person where his private parts are exposed or where his private parts are covered by undergarments this is the offense of bodily privacy now similar offenses found in ipc also which is called voyeurism 354c but let me tell you under ipc okay it is very gender specific offense it can be committed by only a man against a woman if a man sees a woman naked where she is expecting privacy 354c will apply ipc will apply but if a woman sees a man intentionally where the man is expect, expecting privacy the woman will not be liable under ipc however it act section 66a is gender neutral in nature even if a woman captures the naked picture of a man the woman will be liable under 66e of the it act so it act is gender neutral 354c of ipc is gender specific then coming to the next category next type of cyber crime identity theft identity theft means 
suppose everybody has unique password with it hai na so suppose if somebody steals your that steals your one time password or unique password which is known to you only he is committing identity theft section 66c will apply next is phishing now you may have heard this word before phishing it is covered under section 66d of the it act i'll give you an example you may have encountered these phone calls from people who pretend that they are bank officials they want your account information details of your account your one time password everything and thereafter if you give them this information they dupe you of your money basically you are cheated this act is called offense of phishing it is separately covered under it act section 66 okay because you, they may be emailing you they may be calling you over the phone all right so it's better not to reveal such information it is very sensitive information okay if you reveal it it may be misused and the offense of phishing may be committed next is publishing obscene material pornography and child pornography section 67 67 a and 67 b is the complete code of upon pornography or obscenity now let me tell you there is a difference between obscene material and pornographic material supreme court has made the distinction supreme court says in a pornographic material a sexual act is implied if it is a sexual act in a, in pornography there should be two persons okay in the video or the photo whatever material you have if only one person is there that cannot be classified as a sexual act if it is not a sexual act it will not fall within the ambit of pornography it shall be an obscene material so this is the difference okay now even obscenity let me tell you something may be obscene in a rural area in a village something may be obscene the same thing may not be obscene in a metro city something may be obscene in india may not be obscene in usa so these things are required to be taken into consideration and definitely court takes into consideration the environment where this material is published the audience to which this material is published and child pornography let me tell you section 67b not only does make the publishing of child pornography an offense but also it makes the watching of child pornography an offense even watching the child pornography is an offense under india many people do not know it it too is an offense then section 66 of it act it covers plethora of cyber offenses i started with a question that what if somebody steals data from your laptop without your consent and copies it to his pen drive i told you it shall not be an offense of theft because ipc does not contemplate virtual property it talks about tangible property only however here it shall be an offense under 66 downloading copying without permission accessing something without permission instagram account is accessed without permission it is not trespass but an offense under 66 okay similarly introducing virus you can make an analogy here introducing virus why a person introduces a virus in order to cause damage to the computer similar sort of offense is found in ipc called mischief okay like somebody is damaging someone's property it's an offense of mischief but when you introduce virus ipc will not apply it shall be the it act law okay section 66 and lastly section 66f it talks about cyber terrorism see cyber terrorism means using technology in order to propagate 
the idea of terrorism. What is terrorism? Terrorism simply means spreading fear in the society through violence, causing terror in the society is terrorism. So if you use technology, if you use computer, internet, social media to spread fear in the society, it shall be an offense of cyber terrorism. Okay. You may have seen the videos of ISIS or other terrorist organizations which post the beheading videos. Many journalists were beheaded by them and these videos were published. These are acts of cyber terrorism only. Now we have briefly covered the basics of cyber offenses and some of the cyber offenses also. Now it's important to know the remedies against them. Since, let me tell you, it is so easy to commit a cyber offense. It's very difficult to commit a traditional offense. If you want to murder somebody, if you want to cause hurt to somebody, you have to approach to them. You have to be present on spot. Only then you can inflict injury. But a cyber offense can be committed by sitting at home. One can sit in his bedroom on a couch. He can commit cyber offense. He need not be present on spot. Because cyber offense is not committed in real world. It is the virtual world altogether where the cyber offense is committed. So let's talk about the remedies against them. The first remedy which is paramount to report it to the police officer as soon as it is committed. As soon as it is committed, you have to report it to the police officer. If the offense is cognizable in nature, he will lodge an FIR. If he says that offense is non-cognizable, then police cannot do anything. Rather, you have to go to the court, to the judicial magistrate and file a complaint there. Okay. And how do you come to know whether offense is cognizable or non-cognizable? It is dealt under CRPC. The first schedule attached to it provides. All right. Next, a special remedy introduced in IT Act is that every cyber offense has to be investigated by a police officer who shall not be below the rank of inspector. So the investigating officer has to be an inspector at least. All right. And there is special department in every police, in every state, there is special department concerning cyber offenses only. It's called cyber cell department. All right. One more thing is there with the state government. It empowers the state government, not only the state government, but also the central government. If sovereignty of India is threatened, integrity of India is threatened, security of the state is threatened, then the government can intercept the messages. Okay. They can monitor the use of internet. All right. This is the reason why WhatsApp was, WhatsApp was told by the central government to change its policy. Now, still it is not being done properly because WhatsApp says that the messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, so the government cannot trace it. So the government is trying to influence the WhatsApp in this regard. All right. 69A, blocking the access of information. The government can block down the websites. I believe in the last year, many foreign websites, they were blocked by the government by using this provision. Moreover, if you remember, when Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act was introduced, or 370 article of Constitution of India was abrogated, the government blocked entire internet over there. How did government do it? Because it has the power under this section of it. All right. Now there is a, some power with the courts also. Okay. The courts can ask any intermediary to provide location to provide for records with them. Intermediary means 
the service providers it could be facebook whatsapp it could also be the network companies like idea airtel vodafone now i will give you an instance of this how this section was practically used in the courts so an fir was lodged against a person this really happened in the court this is a real incident which i am now quoting so fir was lodged against a person that he committed this offense the offense was causing hurt grievous hurt rather by coming to the victim's house now that person approached the advocate he told him that he has been falsely you know he falsely impl implicated in the case he hasn't actually done it so what did the advocate do advocate filed the application under section 91 of crpc asking the court to provide for the location of this person at the time given in fir on the day given in fir then the company gave the location he was according to the report of the company network service provider the person was not found on spot at that time given in fir and on the date given in fir he was somewhere else if he was somewhere else he did not commit the crime this is the plea of alibi present elsewhere so he was acquitted because of this provision such is the technicality involved in law okay now there is government in initiative also i told you if a cyber offense has been committed against you the first thing you have to do is approach the police officer because delay in lodging the fir destroys the evidentiary value of the fir this is the reason fir should be lodged immediately but for the cyber offenses which relate to sexual abuse or which relate to child pornography initiative has been made by the central government there is a portal cybercrime.gov.in where you can anybody can lodge the complaint and from there the police officer will start the investigation it shall be treated as fir the report which is put in the portal so that's it from my side i believe you really enjoyed the session thank you so much over to you ma'am ruby ma'am okay in the meanwhile ruby ma'am joins the session uh, i would like that the students uh ruby ma'am you are not audible to us wanted us with your visionary thoughts and at any i'm sure you must have it was here hello yes ma'am over to you thank you so much so i believe that the students and the attendees are clear about the information that has been discussed to you so i just yes, uh, want to give just i would like to have only 5 minutes for the out of the presentation while telling the students or the attendees that uh, we people are offering offering such kind of courses as if it is a ba llb bba llb llb and llm program and uh, similar kind of courses in which the student will be able to get specialization on the criminal laws on the cyber laws or other things are being taught to them in the classes moreover as if uh, right now we people are offering the llm program so llm program is again one year and two year kind of programs both the things we are offering to the students and in case if you want to check out the details you could surely check our explore our website then uh, of course we people are dispensing not only the theoretical knowledge as is being discussed in classes but also the practical information that has to be gained by the students through the internships is also there and uh, thus we people are bridging the gap between the theory and the practice just with the these particular remarks i would like uh, that you should be aware of the further admission process and other things for that i request ruby ma'am to take over the charge please over to you ruby ma'am and i believe that the nidesh sharma sir is also here with us hello yes ma'am and sir yes, 
now uh, over to you neera sir for that yeah, thank you so much ma'am now uh, over to you neera sir for that good part of the university uh, over to you neera sir okay thank you so much ruby ma'am very good afternoon all of you so first i'll brief you a little bit about university then we will definitely share the details of and we will what we will do is we will pick one particular program from lot and we will discuss in detail about that program so if i talk about lpu as you are all aware that we are india's largest private university and we are situated in fagwara very close to jalandhar in punjab and it is one of the largest private universities in terms of area and number of students on a single campus right at present we have more than 30000 students who are studying here with us and they are from 50 different countries and we have a very fabulous infrastructure which is spread over more than 650 acres of land so any student who is willing to take admission in law we have various programs as ma'am has already discussed and i'll show you also but at present you have two different options to join one you can just come into our campus and apply for admission and proceed with the process second you can visit our website also so accordingly once you visit the website right so you will you will come to know that this is the very first page and on there is a tab by the name admissions when you click on this tab it will ask you just hold on let me share the screen i think my screen is not visible right so what you have to do is you will visit our website which is lpu.in so once you reach the site on the very first page you will find a tab by the name admissions so when you click on this tab you will find different further tabs asking whether you are looking for programs which are undergraduate or postgraduate and so on so for example if i am a student i am i am a 12th pass out and i am looking for undergraduate program so what i'll do is i'll click on this tab regular programs and if i am interested in law of course i look for the law stream from the different streams which are available in lpu so once the streams are visible to the students so according to my interest and my eligibility i'll click on this law link further i'll come to know that yes we do have ba llb honors also bba llb honors also which is a five years degree so if i'm planning to go for ba llb for example i'll click here and i'll come to know the details of the program the what is the eligibility criteria for example for ba llb honors if if i am interested i need to pass out my 12th with 60% aggregate marks and i should have studied english as a compulsory subject along with this i should have qualified lpu test test which is an in house test of lpu or my rank should be 10000 in clat or 80 percentile or above in lsat this clat and lsat as you are aware these are the national level tests for law so there is an option either you can clear lpunes or clat or lsat depending on the well if it is clat we look for rank and if it is lsat we look for percentile so once the eligibility part is clear then you can go in details about the programs the curriculum which we are teaching here of course with the specialization and electives we are offering if i am ready to know the details that what all will be taught in my first year second year so we have an option here and you can go in depth that what all will be taught to you in autumn term spring term your all basic details will be mentioned here in the website along with that we do have given you an option to choose the electives offered in the curriculum right then of course the fee part which is very important you need to know that what is the fee for this plb honors it is 1 lakh 20000 per semester without any scholarship i am repeating 1 lakh 20000 per semester without any scholarship but we are giving very good scholarships here which have been divided into different categories so what we have done is we have divided the scholarships into three parts you can call them category 3 category 2 category 1 or 
bracket 3 to 1. And there are different ways in LPU through which a student can win scholarships. So the very first category through which a scholarship can be won is on the basis of LPU essays, which is an in-house test of LPU. Now let us take an example that if a student appears for this test and the result of this test falls in bracket 3 or category 3, in that case, 20% of the scholarship will be given to the student and the applicable fee for him will be 96,000 per semester. This is bracket 3. If the score of LPUNS falls in bracket 2, you get 30% scholarship and the fee will be 84,000 per semester. Similarly, if you are lucky to get bracket 1, you will be given 40% scholarship and the fee will be 72,000 per semester. This is on the basis of LPUNS test. Now, any student who is willing to take admission on the basis of CLAT LSAT, as I told you, we look for the percentile as well as the rank according to the national level test which you are appearing for. Apart from that, we have other categories also through which scholarships are provided. Like we do provide scholarships on the basis of 12th percentage as well. Like if the percentage in 12th is between 80 to 89.99, you will be given 20% scholarship. If your percentage in 12th is 90 to 94.99, you are eligible for 30% scholarship. Similarly, if the percentage is 95 and above in your 12th class, you will be eligible for 40% scholarship. Then, of course, we do provide scholarships through different other categories also, like if the parents of the students are in defense, we do give defense-based scholarships. But you need to remember one thing that though there are different categories through which scholarships are given, but we will give you only one scholarship and that too which is highest. For example, if you have one scholarship on the basis of 12th percentage also, on the basis of LPS test also, on the basis of CLAT also, on the basis of LSAT also. So what we do is at the time of finalizing your admission, we will look for all the categories in which you are eligible for admission. So in whichever category you are getting the highest scholarship, the highest one will be given to you and the rest will be taken back. That means you will be given one scholarship which is highest. And the best part in LPU is whatever scholarship you win in the very first semester that gets carried forward for the complete program. Now it's a five years degree. There are 10 semesters. So if you win a particular percentage of scholarship in your first semester, that percentage will be applicable for all five years, all 10 semesters, right? Similarly, as I told you, there are other ways also through which scholarships can be won. But now the most important thing is that how to apply for this. Now, if I'm willing to join BALB, then what I have to do is I have to register myself on our admission portal, which is admission.lpu.in. First, I will register myself by giving the basic details like my name, contact number, email ID, and so on. Once the registration is done, I will get a link on my mobile and my email ID. And after clicking that link and filling for more details, it will take me to the dashboard of that site. And from that dashboard, I can further apply for admission through take admission tab also. And simultaneously, I can apply for LPUNS test also. So for that, you need to remember the important dates. Please do remember the last date of admission is 30th of September. Right? And the last day to appear for this LPUNS test is 3rd of October. So that means any student who is planning to appear for LPU Nest, we have an option that you can book your slot of that exam by yourself. And this slot booking can be done three days prior to the exam. Any student willing to appear for exam on a particular date, the slot booking has to be done three days prior to that exam. So once you appear for that exam, the result will be out within 24 hours. So accordingly, students can come to know 
that what is the exact scholarship which a student has got. And as I told you earlier, whatever scholarship you get in the first semester, that will be applicable for all five years, all 10 semesters. Right? So similarly, so this is the process. You can apply for admission, but what I suggest to you personally, that don't depend on the last date, which is 30th, because during the last date, because these are all professional programs, where we have limited seats with us. So we prefer students on first come, first off basis, all those who are eligible and those who have cleared the test, they'll straight away come and take admission. So if you are really interested to go for law programs, do apply for admission immediately. Don't depend on the last days. Thank you so much. And over to you, Ruby, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir, for the detailed information about the admission part. For the detailed information about the admission part. And before we conclude the session, ma'am, we have a few queries from the community. Uh, with, your, uh, uh, with your permission, we can take a few queries. Sure, ma'am. Please, ma'am, please proceed ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have a query from Parminder Kaur. She wants to know that what is the duration of M uh, LLM? Okay. Ma'am, with regard to the LLM, there has been uh, certain guidelines which have been issued by the UGC and the Bar Council of India. And accordingly, some of the institutions are offering one year or the two year LLM program. Like in our institution, we are offering both the programs depending upon the choice of the students. But at present, the admission in one year program has been preferred by the students. And accordingly, we do have uh, different elective baskets available with us in which we include the business basket. Then we have the criminal laws, constitutional law, IPR and international law. So accordingly, the student may opt for anything, whatever suits their interest. And presently, majority of the people are offering one year LLM. So it is the choice of the student that they want to exercise. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, ma'am, there is another query from Gurjeet Kaur, and that is uh, quite similar to the LLM. Uh, she's in, she wants to inquire about that. Is there, is there any Sorry, kind of experience you... required to be the part of LLM course? Uh, the part of experience, in case of we talk about, if, uh, like suppose there is a specific criteria for the admission in the LLM program. Thereby, we have the LPU nest with us. Plus, the student is supposed to submit the statement of purpose for taking the admission. Like, see, in the statement of purpose, SOP that the student is submitting, there are certain marks assigned for the experience also. Like, it is one of the criteria, but it is not the only criteria for getting the admission. In case if the student is not having the relevant experience in the field, even then, the student should be applying for the course. On the other parameters, the student shall be evaluated and accordingly, the, he or she will be offered the scholarship scheme also. And accordingly, the admission process can be initiated. It is required, it is desired, but not mandatory. Even without the field experience, the student can apply for the admission in LLM. Thank you so much, ma'am. So thank you so much for resolving all the queries of attendees. And with this, we'll conclude our today's webinar. So thank you attendees for sparing time and participating in the webinar. We appreciate you all for being here. And I believe your knowledge has been en uh, enriched by the inputs and learning shared by our experts. Also, I would like to express my appreciation to the experts for their valuable contribution. I'm sure yes. your years of research, your years of experience will definitely help the audience to find the right path. So until next time, I, Ruby, will finally sign off the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here.